Hello, everybody. Hello. And welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. Uh, I'm Alexi, and that's Adam. And we are an online resource and community for up and coming screenwriters. And today, on this lovely Christmas Eve, we are going to be talking about farting. Which oh, shit, it's I'm Christmas excited. Eve. It is, <laughs> isn't about it? That. Wow. Okay. All <laughs> yeah. right. And we're here. There so we are. there's that. Um, but let's give people a little bit of time to trickle in and we might as well just talk about what's going on. So Adam just saw the matrix. Yes. Matrix resurrections. And, uh, I thought the first, uh, aside from the opening scene, I thought the first 30 minutes were amazing and that it totally scene? loses the plot. Um, for me, I, I, uh, this is a totally shallow thing, but I missed the kung fu choreography of uh <laughs> like like really like they I, yeah I forget i forget his name but like the guy who did crouching tiger hidden dragon all of those amazing hong uh, once upon a time in china kung fu hustle all these great hong kong movies did the matrix trilogy and like all this amazing wire work and like athletic you know kung fu sci-fi nonsense that's so fun and part of the tied identity of the story and this felt like shaky cameras Paul Greengrass style, born identity, born identity style, like in your face to hide the bat, hide the fact that Keanu Reeves can't jump high anymore. Um, oh no! Like that, that was my feeling. That was my feeling. That was like what was communicated. Like he did a lot of this, like force field, because maybe because he can't do backflips over walls anymore. You know. Um, oh no! Get but I think it was mostly the way level. it was filmed. It was the way it was filmed, I think, that mm. was kind of like... I, they were going for more gritty American action movie feel. And, like, that just isn't the identity of The Matrix. That being said, I loved the whole meta commentary um, on, like, sequels. Because they, there's this great scene where uh, the in The Matrix... Wait, I shouldn't spoil this. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. It just came out. It's too early to talk about spoilers. I'm, I mean, too I think early. the first 30 minutes are great. First 30 minutes are great. Tell really folks... Good. Tell folks how to watch it real quick. Oh, HBO Max and in theaters. Cool, cool, cool. I really want to see Spider-Man, but isn't that only in theaters? Yeah, it's only in theaters, I think. Um, Unbelievable. But today we're going to talk about carding movies. Uh, and we are. also this carding any sort of uh, screenplay, whether it's a yeah. or pilot or short form stuff, whatever you want. But we're going to talk in the context of feature films because that tends to be the most useful way to learn um, this sort of approach. And yeah. what is carding, Alexi? What would you describe carding? So carding um, is basically, I mean, it's what you see a lot of writers take pictures of when they have like a whole bunch of note cards on their wall and they're trying to plan out a story. Basically, it's just stuff written on note cards in a sequence that tells the writer what they're going to do. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to approach it. And yes, I, this is a way that I think is really helpful that Adam helps me shape and that we figured out over time. And it's just kind of our own thing. And it's been really helpful to us. I'm sure it overlaps with what other people do. I'm not saying it's completely original, but it, it we're going to run through like the nitty gritty specifics of what literally to write on your cards. If you're, if you're going to try to card out your movie. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to break up the information on your cards. Some people do it by like beats, in which case you'd have about, what is it? 56, 56 beats, 56 scenes, really. that kind There's of a thing. range, there's a range. Yeah. Some people um, have like, wait, uh, like 20% more. Some people yeah. do a little bit less, but you should at least probably be in, at least in the fifties. Yeah. And, um, but so that's one way to do it. I tend to do it. A little bit more broken down than that so that it's not just each beat it's each scene like each time we would change i want to have like the scene heading on it and know where i'm gonna go and start seeing it in my head um and when that happens i tend to end closer to like 70 80 um and sometimes that's long sometimes it's not but this is basically just after you've done everything else in our outlining process that we've talked about, you've had your idea, you've worked into a log line, you've gotten it into a tentpole document, you're moving into outlining things. This is the step right before you're finally going to go 
to pages. And you want to plan out exactly what you're going to be writing so that when you sit down in front of the computer, you never really, like, you never, you never don't know what to write. You have a note card with a prompt for yourself and you know exactly what you're going to, what you need to do. And you can just put it on the page. And I find that is incredibly helpful. Um, and it also has the added benefit of letting you see your movie from beginning to end without having committed to this, like writing the scene yet. So you aren't in love with it. That way you're more willing to cut stuff that doesn't work and move things around and see yeah. what works. And that, that sort of um, flexibility, that sort of um, ability to, uh, what's the word? Just flexibility to move sequencing, to change mm -hmm. around ordering, to look at things outside of like a Word document or, a, you know, a spreadsheet, whatever it is, like just to be able to physically have note cards. A lot of people don't use physical note cards anymore, but I think there's something kind of appealing about just sort of seeing the story in a different form. Um, just yeah. almost like seeing a different like organization of the same sequence of ideas makes you see that sequence differently. So like there, there's just like a, no matter what you write on the note cards, you're yeah. going to get something out of just see it, doing the work of seeing it in a, your story in a different form. Um, so, there, there are some people just to glass yeah. who don't, who just sort of write the things that happen in the scene. Yep. You know, like it, it, the, the, it can be very simple. So you don't have to like make it, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's depends on what type of story you're doing. If you're doing like an hour long, if you're doing hour television, for example, like drama, I think the note cards would probably be more detail oriented Yeah. than maybe some other things. So that's fair. So I wanted to show you, this is what I do for every single picture or anything that I've ever written. There's my stack of lovely note hey, cards. Hey, there they are. For the most recent thing. And then Adam, I carded your and my movie that we were working on together somewhere. Yeah. Um, but I always like to do it on physical note cards because it helps me. Um, just, there's something about like getting out of a word processor and just like being like, Ooh, reality. Oh yeah. That's the movie. There, there's just something kind of grounding about that. Um, I think it's useful for going from, I don't know, just thinking through what you're going to do before you do it. Yeah. I would agree with this Aiden. Um, absolutely. Aiden said that I imagine carding must be extremely useful and that the writer can see how each action or beat plays into the next. Sometimes when you go head first in the pages, the way the story flows makes no sense. Exactly. So yep. what I what I do after I finish carding is I will go up to somebody who is very patient and who I trust has a good judgment of story, and I will literally tell them my movie. Like I will go through Martina. Oh my hey, we've got some old, hey. old old characters hanging around here. Pooja, Martine. <laughs> hey guys, how's it Good going? To see you all. Um, but so normally what I will do is after I finish the stack of note cards, I'll literally go talk to someone like Carl yeah. or probably Adam's coming up one of these days. And I will just tell them the movie verbally and flip through the cards as I go and see how it goes. And I mean, that's going to take a while because you're literally telling them the movie. Um, yeah. But it, if if they're willing to go along with you for it, they can tell you exactly where things make sense. You can see what's interesting to them. You can see when they get lost. You can see when you start fumbling and being like, and then I don't really know what happens, but like right, somehow right, right. this happens here. You know, it just, it gives you a better sense of what you're doing so that by the time you go to commit it to the page, you know the information you're putting down and you know what works. And just to add on to that, there's something this is kind of similar to what the thing I do before carding, which is uh, I call it snow plow, so snowballing, right? So doing an exercise where in 30 minutes, I force myself to write out and tell myself the story from like the top of my head and like be open to, if I say something differently, I say it differently. If I omit something, I omit something. Just telling the story just to get a real sense of like, where does my brain naturally go? What is, mm -hmm. what do I spend time on? What do I skip over? What is important? Like, I think going through a lot of thoughtfulness and really feel, getting outside of the document of your outline to really just sort of think about like telling your story and how it feels like sounding. It's kind of similar as reading out the note cards people, but I think you should do a lot of verbal storytelling aspects of like processing things. But so, so you really just know it. And like, 
if you've made a decision, you've made it because it feels right five times rather than you just decided that one day you were feeling you were feeling yourself and you had an idea and you're like, and then that's it. And you never think about it again. And you never think about it in context, in the flow. You never think like, well, I just had two scenes that are very similar back to back yeah. or two moments that, you know, maybe I could just make it one or you, those sort of decisions. Like you want to get those out in this carding process. And I just get really comfortable telling the story. And the last thing I'll say is what well, you just did that form of what you're describing Going yeah. through the note cards and telling the story to somebody, that's pitching. That's a version that of pitching true. a story. Um, mm -hmm. Although you wouldn't be no, you wouldn't be like listing every single thing that happens in a pitch, ideally. You're you're no. compressing to the most important things. I would hope um, not. So I just remember that this is where my other note cards are. And I was hey. hoping that I might have the Jojo Rabbit ones that I used in I do the Jojo Rabbit ones that we used in the course. That I think might be a better reference than my own personal. I forgot you ones. did that. I know, me too. And then I just now remembered. Um, I think that these would be a better reference because, first off, I wrote them for other people. So my handwriting is not horrendous, as you can. Ooh, can you read that at all? A little. Yeah, a little. yeah, hold it on. Yeah, there we go. Hang on. Let's see. But yeah, but these Jojo Rabbit ones are much cleaner. So hold on for a second. So let's see what's on. I I love what uh, I've started doing. What you what you with the the in, like saying the scene heading at the top of the card, because mm -hmm. when you're like transcribing when you're drafting for the first time, it's just another thing you don't have to think about when yep. going into the into the word processor. This is actually much clearer than I thought it would be if I held it up, even though it keeps going in and out. Yeah. I'm impressed. So. That's one approach to a note card. Another one, I mean, I, 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 I have a little different. Um, I, I have, I have uh, some things that I occasionally will put down for like significant moments or scenes, like as a mm -hmm. check, like on the other, I'll, I'll write down what the character wants and what they do to get what they want. Yeah. Because I want to make sure that the characters are making choices and like so like it's kind of like uh, you could do a whole note card uh pass your movie where you just sort of note the choices the character makes and yeah but that's really important because there, there's it's so easy to like note card a movie and just realize that like and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens and it's kind of dull as dull as fuck so sorry i'm cursing a lot today <laughs> i've been told not to do that um you know it does you know who's told you that I've just been told not to do it. Gosh. Sean's Sean's uh, Sean's partner apparently believes that I never curse. I remember they told me that once, and mm. I was like, "Well, that's mm. not true." Uh, but I kind of want to. <laughs> I, I appreciate that somebody had that mental image of me. Um, um, yeah, no, it is. Yeah, that's a good point too, Aiden, about looking at it backwards. Um, so I guess just to get right into it, I want to share the approach that helps me. Um, so, and then we can sorry, also I was going out of order. You should, you should, you should have done this first. <laughs> no, you're all good. Um, yeah, and then I'll also show, so there's, there's things that we suggest that you can do. And I'll also show you the parts that I actually do. I actually do most of it. It's just the stuff on the back. I don't tend to, unless it's a really, really important scene. So let's go through it. Awesome. So I wish I could take a screen grab. Um, but we probably should the have the digital version of this. Yeah, we do somewhere, but here we go. <laughs> Can people see it okay? So anyway, this is the first scene of Jojo Rabbit. And as you can see, there's a few different sections for information here. At the very top, you have the scene heading, the like exact scene heading that would appear in the script. So interior, Jojo's house, day. And then you also have a number on the card to tell what order it goes in. So this is scene number one. Right beneath it, you have a description of what happens in the scene. We have Jojo is getting ready for Nazi youth camp, and imaginary Hitler is hyping him up. So that's loosely what happens in this scene. It takes place in his house. It's the first scene of the movie. Jojo's getting ready. Imaginary Hitler hypes him up. And then this is a part that I find extremely helpful that 
I would recommend you definitely do. It's something I always do. This EST, which to me stands for establishes. And what that means is yeah. I'm making a list for myself of why the scene matters. John always says that you're going to have to defend every single scene in your movie. Um, like and that. so this is where you say, this is why the scene is here. This is what I would lose if I cut it. Um, and that's why this, this, that's why this scene is essential. So this scene is particularly important because it introduces our protagonist, Jojo. It introduces our false mentor, Hitler. It introduces Jojo's flaw that he is a Nazi and it introduces his inner need, which is, has to do with control and power. And so granted these flaws and inner need are not like the more, um, I'm not listing the version. full belief. Yeah. It's not the sophisticated yeah. version. It's just kind of introducing the loose idea of what happens in this scene. Um, and then the wording of the statement, it matters just to add on. It's like, what are they doing in the scene? He's yeah. getting ready for camp. It's not like he's sitting and things happen to him. He's getting ready for camp. And there's a conflict between him and his imaginary friend or mm -hmm. the situation. Like that, like there are things happening and the character is doing something like that. Like if you're going to get, take one thing away from note carding, make sure that your characters are doing things in all your scenes. It's, it's amazing how often that can escape people. Agreed. So I'm going to, I'm making a list by the way, so that we can pull it up on a word document. Um, and you can see in a moment. But I'll show that at the end. So then, so that's what I always do on every single scene. And then something that we came up with that I think is helpful um, yeah. is stuff on the back. And that is just really, really thinking about characters in this world and what they want in the scene. And this is especially important if it's an important critical character scene, uh, which basically is, is most except for transitional moments. Um, so in this, I've written out what each main character in the scene wants and how basically trying to say like how these contradict. So at the top one, I have that Jojo wants to convince himself that he's ready and he's in control and he's power and he has power. And then Hitler is trying to make Jojo into a Nazi to get him there. So those are the two conflicting things because we know that Jojo feeling in power has to do with his inner need and being a Nazi has to do with his flaw. So that's where immediately we get that clash going on. Um, that's a funny sentence. Um. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, <laughs> and, no. then, uh, and then we also have this little thing right here, which is something that Adam recommended about the arrow pointing up is tracking the energy of the scene. So in this scene, we end on a high note, like we're jazzed up. So it says that like he's ending on a high note, he's hyped up. And that can help you as you transition into the next scene to think about like, if I just really, really hyped this character up and I'm gonna cut to them being super depressed, I need to use that, I need to know that that's what I'm doing, right? Yeah. Like it needs to be, like if I'm gonna change the, the tempo, of what I'm doing so much, I need to know that I'm doing it on purpose and that I have control of the pacing. Um, but in general, unless you're going for something super abrupt and just trying to cut the momentum for, for emphasis, you aren't going to go from something super, super hyped up to just dead the next scene. And then we also have a little three listed there because that was my guesstimate of how many pages this is going to take. Um, so this is just kind of extra information that you can, but don't have to add if you want to think more about character and just like help them your planning, especially if it's your first time going through it. But the front of the card is really what I would recommend doing every single time. And that's what I do every single time. Um, and then I did that for each scene moving through. Uh, so the second scene is Jojo runs into the camp. He meets Yorkie. They're all doing their Heil Hitler. And this is establishing the normal world, which is Nazi Germany and his friend Yorkie, which is a, you know, friends and enemies type thing. And uh, let's see. So they keep going. I'm not going to go through every scene, obviously, but I'm just going to go to the next two. The next scene is that they're at camp. Jojo and Yorkie attend orientation. Kleinzendorf gives a, Kleinzendorf gives a welcome speech. 
we learn that the Nazis are losing. That's part of the normal world. Jojo gets a dagger, which is a setup for later. We meet um, Kay and Finkel. I think that's their names. Friends. And we see that his objective is to join Nazis. Um, and let's see. Then what? It's just a comment. I, we're all uh, we're all good. Yeah. It's all good. I I swear it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, think Martin was uh, was actually upset, and if and if he was, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So then that's the next funny. one, the fourth scene, is that it's interior exterior. So that's how I would handle that. If you like are going to be going from inside to outside, you don't necessarily have to do like a bunch of different cards to try to figure out mm. like exactly how it's going to shake out. You can just simplify it, say interior, exterior, Jojo, Yorkie, and other boys do some absurdly dangerous anti-Semitic training. And Jojo sucks at this. So we're hitting an obstacle really, really hard. Um, and then... I wanted to show what I do if I make a mistake and I jump and I realized like, I went ahead and I did card five. But then I realized going back through that I made a mistake and I want to add a card in between four and five. Just do something like this. I add card 4.1 and it's magically fixed. That way we don't have to, uh, you know, go back in and completely redo everything, which is something that I would do when I was super obsessive. And I realized I can just call it card 4.1, 4.2, and sneak it in. And that is a way to make edits as you go. Um, there's also, as you saw, highlights on the card. This yep. is something that you can consider doing after. And in this case, um, it just it really depends on what you're trying to trying to track throughout the scene. Like if you're doing some sort of a mystery, you might track every single time that they like get a clue or like which path they're on, whose perspective you're telling. In this one, I thought that the most relevant thing was to track who's in what scene, in particular Jojo and his imaginary friend, um, to see how often yeah. his to see how often Hitler comes up. Because if you're using this imaginary friend device, you want to make sure that first off he's establishing it the very first scene. We're getting an imaginary friend in the very first scene to show that this is something that we're going to be playing with in terms of format. And then you're going to see it come up at pretty regular, like we're not going to be allowed to forget about it and being able to see all of your cards laid out with the color on it, looking for, okay, where does orange show up? S shows you, wow, look, I have a 20 card stretch there that has no orange. I should probably keep that a little, like I should probably at least add one moment to make it more consistent. Um, and that is loosely my, our approach to carding. So I want to add in something that mm -hmm. thought, thought that I know, I know that a lot of people struggle with carding and I have a theory about why this is, and I have a suggestion for how to avoid it. Um, a lot of people struggle with carding because they have to feel they have to generate material while like a lot of material and make a lot of choices and constantly be undoing and redoing as they're doing it. Whereas I feel like what we're describing is more of an editorial process to deal with like an existing tent pole or outlet. Like if you feel like you're constantly having to like come up with ideas to fill out the note cards, you probably haven't outdone prep work for the carding. Like I feel like it's easier to do like what like what I do is I do the snow plowing or snowballing, you know, where I just I just brute force the story. I'll just tell myself I'll I'll sit down, write the story from memory, even if I don't know where I'm going, and then I stop and then I do it again and again and again. And in maybe in a few hours, I have like four versions of the story and it's been sort of honing, honing, honing. I would take that type of document, that type of material into carding rather than just going into carding from a tent pole, if that makes sense. Because I want to have little scene ideas. I want those transitional ideas already thought of, different versions of them. Because I want to go to carding yeah. and be like, oh, that doesn't work. I should make that better. Rather than, hmm, what should go here? Yeah. Before I get to carding, typically what I do is I have my tent pole and do something that we call a beat sheet, which is... I then have a completely new document and I start imagining what is this going to look like in order. 
And yes. I start actually putting the tent pole into scenes and being like, okay, I know who the protagonist is. How am I going to introduce the protagonist? And just doing a little bit of connective tissue. It's not going to be everything, but it's just that one extra step right before you go to carding so that you have a little bit more to work with. Our approach to screenwriting is really, really based on building a little bit more each time you go. It's a cake so that, or, a, yeah. or a house. You're building a house. Um, yeah. So, so I think what might be useful is to sort of ha write out like the the process the, the the pipeline the assembly line mm. of each of each like of our suggested assembly line. There are a million ways to write a story. You don't have to start here. Typically, though, if like if I was recommending somebody to be like, hey, you want to start a movie idea and you just have an idea to taking it through the whole process, um, yeah, I would idea. I would call it idea slash premise where you like question the idea and be like, is there a story here? And what I would do here is I would write practice log lines. I would take my idea and make it into a tight log line with protagonist, inciting incident, objective and antagonist. I don't have to know where the story ends necessarily, but I like, I have to know that like those ingredients exist in this idea. Even if those things change, like I think that's a great way to test if an idea works. Because mm -hmm. if you can figure this out beforehand, like at, at the one sentence level, it's easy to rewrite a sentence. You aren't fixing, oh, sh oh, you know, damn, I don't have, um, I picked the wrong protagonist and I carded a movie. Is a terrible <laughs> place to be. Actually, uh, I think Alexi and I did that for uh, move, the movie we were, we were writing. You know, we're like, we like, oh, we- but luckily we didn't get too. We did. I guess we did do a rough draft. We did do. So we, we did. We did, did do a first draft. But so you'll still get caught, even if you even if you do this. But I would say that we're closer than we could have been. We just need a perspective shift because we did all of this stuff before. You yeah, know? John T. That, this is a great point. A lot of people, a lot of people struggle with this, and I think that it might. It's. I don't think carding is for everybody. Totally don't. Um, but mm -hmm. I think it can be a great tool to professionally approach a project fast. I think it saves time later on. Like, I think it saves drafts. I genuinely believe that. But I don't think that every writer should have to feel the pressure to do it. And um, I think some of that writer's block can be mitigated by doing different types of prep work that isn't editorial. Because if you're like, like that, that's that, um, you know, the tent pole and like what I was talking about, the snow plow, snowballing um, exercise, that is an idea generated idea generation exercise versus carding, which is an editorial exercise. And mm. I think people get writer's block when they're doing editorial and generation at the same time. And it just crosses wires. Or when you're doing too much of one and not the other. That's right. So. That's right. Because if you're all editorial and you don't have the idea fully like thought out in terms of execution, pacing and transitions and ideas, you can get stuck being like, oh God, this isn't working. What do I do? And just want to move on and just, just go to writing. And now that being said, you can totally go straight from like a really basic outline to a uh, first draft. You can. I do believe that you're going to have an extra two drafts. So another another point I almost that I forgot to bring up is that what's so nice about carding for me is that once I finish all the cards, I sit down in front of my computer. I know Adam does his first draft by hand, but I am a spinner. And I've I've, I've uh, I have cheated on that before though. I try to do it by <laughs> hand. <laughs> I try. But you sit down in front of whatever you're going to be doing, and then you use these note cards as prompts for yourself. Yeah. So. I already have where the scene is taking place. I know exact. I know loosely what's happening in the scene. I know who. I know what it has to accomplish, um, and then I can just go from there. So now it's it's like you've written yourself these prompts, and now you can sit down in front of the computer. You know where it's going to be. You know loosely what's going to happen, and you can let yourself still have that moment of writing where you just kind of get to see like what magic happens. And so something that I think is really, really important is that on your note cards, you leave them as streamlined and simple as you can. You don't start going in there and writing dialogue and start planning out the scene. You leave it open for yourself so that you can still have some of that, you know, like the, 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 like the magic that happens when you hit flow 
and you just like start seeing things, things start connecting and things like, and um, your writing just works. I feel like leaving yourself the space to do that is a really important part of carding. Don't make it so detailed that it's boring by the time you actually get to write down the scene. Give yourself some room to play. Um, so do you have, here we go. Do you have to do carding physically or are there good digital ways of doing it? Definitely not asking because of my handwriting. There are, there are good There's ways to do ones. it digitally. Yeah. Art um, Studio Pro has some great uh, options. Uh, and we're not just saying that because we have a brand deal with them. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we have a discount for you. We don't get anything back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we don't get a cut, but yeah, there, there there's so many good op options out there. Honestly, I that's a really good one. I found. That's Let me see if I can open it up. Let's see how my. Let's see if I can do it. I haven't updated it in a bit since we took a break from our script, Adam. But me and yeah. Adam, since we were writing this during the era of COVID, um, we outlined our script completely um, using. Arc Studio Pro, and I really like the way that they do it. Here we go. I write using Final Draft because I'm used to it, but I would love to outline more in Arc Studio. I had a great time outlining there. Yeah, I've had the worst time of my life outlining in Final Draft. <laughs> I can't do it to save my life. That's... So this is um, this yeah, is we're not going to go into the no cards, but. We we organize them all uh, yep. here. So this is how we did it. And what's handy dandy is that you can color code this way and this way. So we have tracked which character appears in each scene using this. And then we've tracked the perspective character using the color tab on the side. So there's a few times when our perspective is with the antagonist. And that's how come we have different colors. Um, but... This is my favorite um, way to do it. You see that we have done the same thing that we recommend doing in the cards. Um, some of them do it more than others, but we describe what happens. Um, all the events. We, all the events. Um, we say why the scene is there. And some of this, honestly, we kind of skipped a few steps because we did it Definitely. in a different document. Um, and also this was, I mean, I think we, because this was done in conversation, it wasn't done like solo work. I would, I like, I would do like the back, I would write the things that I would write out mm -hmm. if I was doing it by hand and you would do your thing in the way it looks. So like, I think this communicates that this can be whatever it is the project needs to be. Like whatever's useful for you going to the process. Like there's no standardized approach for uh, yep. doing this. This is Arc Studio Pro. Um, and I believe if you want a discount, you can just type in uh, Young Screenwriters in caps. Uh, yeah. And that will give you a discount. <laughs> Let me see if I can grab you all a link. And how much is it? It's like, it's like a, it's a subscription, you know. Yeah, but there's also a free version. So oh, yeah, free versions free. if you like it. Um, yeah. And then if you do, then we have a discount code somewhere in the world yeah and what's cool is you can like change the view of this where you're like where it graphs out actually the data points you add so like the colors so if you have it like being like oh red is this character oh can, yeah you can change the view uh it's very cool how do i do it again this i oh that was it and then I, you can zoom in and see the timeline. I don't remember how to zoom in, but like these are every well, single. We card. would have set it up if yeah. we set it up with specific data points that made sense. It would it would look good, but we didn't set it up for that. But no, and also it's part of that's because they really really listen about what people want, not to hype them too hard. But they add features a lot. They've added a lot of features since me and Adam made this <laughs> made these cards, um, yeah. including the graphs and things. So like let's that. go back to the word document because I want to I want to finish that list of. Uh stuff we're sure. doing yeah because i realized we just did log light and i was like oh wait, wait, let me just finish that up yep. because i think you know hey this is a crazy brutal disgusting illogical world why not have a clean approach for writing a story right so first is idea premise like and oh yeah 
I just want to pull out the actual log line as its own thing because what? I think it's an important step. Because you're oh, you mean the log line formula log we use? Oh, no, I just mean like the first step is idea premise and the way you can get there is by playing with log lines. And oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the next official step is, okay, what's your log line? Great, great. Yeah. So um, I'm obsessive. <laughs> no worries. Uh, <laughs> the next thing I would do is I would, I would transition into a tent pole. But the first thing I would do before doing a tent pole is I'd ask myself what the act breaks are. What are the big beats in the story? So specifically, you know, protagonist, normal mm -hmm. world, inciting incident, the act one break into act two, which is the call to action usually, the midpoint, the act two break into act three, which is the ultimate test. All is lost, final uh, final fight. So that's eight beats. So I, I, I asked myself like the big, really important things, like what are those moments? And I don't have to like have it like all like really thought out, but like, just to get a sense of like, and it doesn't have to be what it ends up being. Like totally be fluid with this. Like the whole point is that this is a tool for you to like find the story. And it would be absolutely insane if the first thing you thought of um, to sort of find the story is what it ends up being. Like that's just yeah. not gonna happen. But by thinking in those terms, you'll at least like put placeholders that will put you in the right direction and like sort of give you like a framework for the ideas of being like, Oh, that's the sort of thing that would work in a movie. Um, yeah. And so I think it'll this, be a great prompt. Yeah. So this was what we, in this little series, the mini series that we've been doing on like the steps of writing screenplay and like outlining and all of that. This was the one that we, we did right before temples, which was um, originally it was Pixar's six, like the way that the, the way that Pixar tells a story in six beats. Um, this was their example with Finding Nemo. Yeah, and yeah. then Adam made a completely original version, which is seven sentences instead of six, because we add one more because of that. So now I can brand it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but now it's Adam's. And uh, and that's just a fact. So I would say that this is kind of this is what Adam's talking about. It's coming up with big story moments. Um just like loosely of what's going on. And real quick, as a reminder, we can read through what Nemo's was just yeah. so that you can uh, get a sense of what this might sound like. This is different uh, because this is the, 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 the Pixar version, not the Adam version. Yeah. Uh, the Adam version would have one more because of that. <laughs> because I would want the act two to be a little bit more defined. Like this is all act one heavy. Yeah. So you want to read it, Adam, or shall yeah, I? Sure. Once upon okay. a time, there was a widowed fish named Marlin who was extremely protective of his only son, Nemo. Every day, Marlin warned Nemo about the ocean's da dangers and implored him not to swim far away. Until one day, in an act of defiance, Nemo ignores his father's warnings and swims into the open water. Because of that, he is captured by a diver and ends up in the fish tank of a dentist in Sydney. One layer of hell. Uh, because of that... <laughs> Marlin sets off on a journey to recover Nemo, enlisting the help of other sea creatures along the way until finally Marlin and Nemo find each other, reunite, and learn that love depends on trust. So for this version, this is the Pixar version. Uh, I think they, I would develop Act 2 and Act 3 better. So if you go up, like I would have compressed um, beat 5 into beat number 4 here because of that. Uh, because mm -hmm. I want to know the midpoint twist. <laughs> yes. That's so important. And this and their version doesn't have a midpoint twist. And it's like, man. Give yeah, us more. Just, <laughs> just, just, just try. And here's the thing. Don't like pressure yourself. Like, oh, the first, if you come up with something and you're just like, oh, I don't really like like that. Um, but just try it. You know, like put, put a placeholder. Like you can always fix something. You can always make an idea better. I truly believe I will that. say. So something that is really hard, but you're going to have to commit to do is you're going to have to write down bad ideas. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. You have Get to. comfortable it's with gonna it. Happen. Yep. You're yeah. going to have to just accept that you're going to know. You're, sometimes you're not going to know you're doing it. Sometimes you're going to know you're doing it and it's going to suck. You have to write bad ideas. And the whole thing with screenplays is that this is like, have you ever tried to build, I remember at like kids museums or something, you like build a suspension bridge. And it's really difficult because you basically have to like put everything together at the same time and then it'll hold. But like everything is dependent on each other. And that's kind of how I think about screenwriting is everything is so inter like in interdependent that like you can't know what the objective is until you know what this other piece is. And you can't know what the best version of the flaw is until you know what the best 
until you know what your objective is. You can't know all these different things. You can't know who the best antagonist is until you know what the theme is and all these different pieces where you need to know something to know something else. And there's no clear start to where this tangled thread is. And so in order to start solving it, you just have to start putting in placeholders and shifting it a little bit more, a little bit more at a time until you get it into something that you like. But that means being okay with writing things that are not your favorite at first and then knowing that you will crack it later. Yeah, um, so I, so what if they're all bad ideas? LOL, uh, downtrodden face. Um, I honestly, <laughs> I I don't think all I I think I think very few ideas are actually legitimately bad ideas. Like there are lots of half baked ideas. Yeah. Like like something that like looks bad on the page, oftentimes is just one adjustment away from being interesting. Um, I, I I really believe that. Like from from like brainstorming with people, like sort of seeing the moment where like oh I'm frustrated, this doesn't sound good. To oh my god, the eyes light up and like oh I see something there. That's interesting. That has potential. Like that that transition is so often just taking something and moving it 45 degrees to the left or right. And I know that's a terrible metaphor, but like it like what I'm trying to say is like you'd be surprised that bad ideas with small adjustments can be great ideas. So like. This guy goes, goes in that, that my philosophy, like things, everything's fixable. I mean, not every, yes. there are some really bad, there are bad ideas out there. I don't want to say like, oh, there are no bad ideas. No, there are, but like most of them can be better and most of them can be great ideas with just one movement to the left um, or right. At the end of the day, you can, uh, I forget the screenwriter and the project, but I remember there was a famous screenwriter who like intentionally was, took a challenge, no, it was a novelist. He, he took, he was a fantasy novelist and he took the challenge of, oh, I think it was Jim Butcher. I'm, I might butcher that. That, that might be the guy. He, the, the, his, I forget the, the name of the famous series, but like he, he took a challenge to take a terrible idea. Oh, wizard, uh, private investigator in Chicago oh, this and guy. make a book about it. Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. Like, but like, I, I think that was it, but like it, but, or there's some other author, but like they took the terrible idea was like, okay, how can I actually make that work? And it's execution, baby, you know, like it's, it's it was all another execution. one. There was another one where his two ideas were Pokemon and the Roman Empire. And then he, this guy like ended up creating this series, like the fairies of Calderon or something, which is like super popular in its niche. Um, but, and also I'm going to argue against Pokemon being a bad idea. Pokemon is a fabulous idea. No, 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 it's Pokemon idea. mixed with Roman centurions or is a bad is a bad idea. <laughs> no, 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 that is a bad idea. <laughs> like that's so like <laughs> makes you go, oh, yep. headache. But oh, this make is, it great. Yeah, this is a great point. This was something that was recommended to me when I was young and I have done it. I got out of the habit recently and I need to get back into it. But ideas for dialogue. This is a huge John one. Write down what people say. John is such yeah. a freaking eavesdropper. That's He's good. such a little creep. He, uh, he'll write down everything that people say and do and like weird characteristics and things that you just see people, like quirks that just like really are, tell something about the person. Uh, just get in the habit of writing them down um, so that you can reference it later or so this, that you get used to paying attention. And they'll show up in your writing whether you are checking your list and trying to put them in or not. Um, it's just good to start listening to things that are really interesting. Totally. Like and, and there are different access points into yeah. story. Like this is what is really like kind of the al it's, it's, story writing is like alchemy, right? It's like mysterious and it's belabored and it's confusing from the outside and the inside. You know, it's, it's an interesting mixing of ideas, imagination, hard work, all of these, you know, but, but, at the end of the day, I think uh, a, the metaphor, I would say like a lot of bad ideas are just unfinished. If you're going to, if I'm going to use the, uh, the terrible, uh, you know, sculpting metaphor. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a block of rock is not particularly um, inspiring necessarily, but with work and attention and, and, and discipline, you can really make something work. Like you, you, you could write down like 10 ideas and you just don't feel inspired to them. 
might be just be you just don't have the right access point. Like you could take a terrible idea and be like, and and then just ask yourself, who would what would be the most um, what would be the best pair of eyes to see this situation? And you might surprise yourself by how energy changes in an idea. Because an idea might sound bad because you had a bias or an assumption about who the story would be about. But like, mm -hmm. you could take, a, you know, a pirate story or something like, and like everybody goes for the the swashbuckler or the, the captain. Like who would be a pair of eyes for a pirate story that would take a generic situation and make it not generic? Like those types of questions are what make bad ideas great ideas. And it's so often how you see it. So I, I sorry to belabor that point too much. Um, no, it's good. And also, by the way, for anybody who is asking, this is what it is. I found it. This is our coupon code. You should be able to clink, click, clink, click the link in the description. Um, that should be 75% off. But again, I'm going to recommend doing the free version first, maybe saving this and seeing if it's right for you, just making sure that it's something that you like to use. Um, I think that it's the best online slash like digital outlining tool I've ever seen. I Brilliant. still like writing in final draft just because I'm used to it and I don't like change. Um, uh, <laughs> but and there is something nice about not having a subscription, another subscription, I will say. Yes. <laughs> not to undercut the link right below, but. Um, yeah. But I think you can use the, the planning tools and stuff without it. So I just, I'd consider checking it out, seeing what you think. And then if you want to get 75% off, there you go. Um, so this so, is an interesting point, Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I was watching this Dutch series recently, and the dialogue was so absolutely unnatural. Dialogue seems easy to do, but then watching something that totally bombs at it really changes your perspective. I would agree, and I would say some of the most egregious things I've ever seen come from when people who don't know how children talk write children. Um, or just any, or just any, <laughs> like, any Ooh. group, any identity, any any anything that feels like the, there was the dissonance between that's not I don't believe that right yeah like I don't believe a kid would say that I don't believe a mother would say that after just losing her child I don't believe you know what, what insert insert uh whatever like but like so much of like bad dialogue I also I sorry I'm so opinionated today but so much of bad dialogue is the writer not establishing clearly why a character wants something to the audience and expressing that in a in a in an earned way and i know that like that can seem as a cheat like the earned way but like it, i mean that to like connect to like okay why does this person want this thing um and how are they expressing that in a way that's true to them like, like simplifying it into that way can often fix a lot of bad dialogue. I don't know. But usually there's a disconnect either in the expression, like being like, well, a child would never say that. Or B, why are they talking about this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember what show I was watching, but it was like otherwise a pretty fun show. And I was just like, what is that child doing? Like, I can't, <laughs> I can't remember what it was, but it was just... And also the director clearly like could not direct children. When kids are like not good actors, I 100% always pin it on the director. I feel like that's just how my brain goes. But it's it's so some... fun to like, but it's fun to mock children and belittle them, right? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, um, so here we go. Don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that, please. It's too late. You're quoted. Um, let's see. So we have the first step is idea premise and to kind of get at that, it's like, is there a story here? Log line, we've talked about that. Um, we could pull up some formulas if that would be helpful. Um, but three is you move into Adam's co completely original seven sentences, AKA Pixar, <laughs> which is what we just talked about, which is coming up with basically a run on paragraph of what your story is from beginning to end, hitting on the most important tentpole beats. Then we move into step four, which is actually doing the tentpole document, which we've shared a bunch. Um, and that gets into every single element of story, not just like the the biggest ones. This gets into things like objective and motivation as a separate piece. Um, gets into things like the nitty gritty of the final fight. 
it's really where you decide exactly what shape your story is going to take. Um, and then Adam, I would say Beat Sheet is next. Yeah, I, 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 I confess, I personally don't really use Beat Sheets. I go you straight do from Snowball. Tech. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like an inf that informal process. Mm -hmm. Just for me, because by the time I've reached a temple, I'm so sick of that. You know, like I, I want to have a little bit of wiggle room and I want by, by on the way to carding. Uh, but that's just me. That's just me. Like I go from temple to carding. I go to temple and then that like snowballing and then uh, carding. But then again, I'm, it's just a different it's a, I'm still doing something. It's not like I'm lump, leaping right into it. Hate <laughs> yourself. Fix it. That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> On, honestly, so much of just like leveling up as a writer is just like embracing that first drafts are bad by like, and yeah. like you aren't special or different in that respect that the, Hey, do you know what? I, I also came up with an ex another extremely original uh, saying, great writing is rewriting. I came Ooh. up with that. Yeah, I know. Yeah? I know. Wow. Completely original to me. Great writing is rewriting. And you know what? If everybody on the planet says that constantly, maybe it's true. Um, no. All drama Maybe is writing's conflict. really fucking hard work. <laughs> All drama is conflict, Adam. That's another one of your original ideas. No, that was John's original idea. He came up <laughs> with that in 1972 <laughs> after watching Indiana Jones and was like, hmm. <laughs> You know, I think all drama is conflict. <laughs> and it was never thought of by anybody before then. Um, just nope. kidding. And it was John with hair. <laughs> Haired John. Um, Aristotle figured that out. Oh, good. I'm glad that you're enjoying. And Dilla says he's enjoying bad movies and TV shows more thanks to our lessons. I love Why? bad movies. I, I really can, enjoy like, them. Because you can figure out what's wrong. No, just, just I just love like, oh. I just love uh, belittling and mocking them. No, I'm just kidding. now actually actually it takes so much effort and time to make a bad movie. Um, it's not a good habit to 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 mock. Uh, I think it's it's totally fair to say, oh, that doesn't work. I like the films. I like the bad films that know they're bad films. Mm. Or at least yeah. no, that's not true. I'm I'm being I'm being like dishonest. I I, I like to belittle that... movies. I like to make fun of them. Being I will say that it has been advised that so for anyone's reference that you never John trash T. another Sorry. creator. No, you're right. That, that, you Adam totally caught me. I'm being yeah. I'm being an idiot. That was right. <laughs> um, wow, John was watching uh was watching that then. There you go. <laughs> See, that's how far ahead of the curve he was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Alexia, cut you off. No, no, no. I don't even remember what I was going on, but uh. It's okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we we devolved into talking about our our entire flow chart. Um, hate yourself, fix it. There's a lot more to say there. Yeah. Yeah. There so, is. I, I I I I never get sick of talking about my process. Uh, but what I do is I I hate word processors like i hate the blank page in a word processor so i love to edit and ch and make and improve in a word processor i don't like to generate content in them so i do like i have historically and i do like to handwrite my first drafts in pen so i can't rewrite them and here's the thing about writing in pen it feels less real than when it's in the word processor. Like I can deal with bad lines and bad writing when it's written out in a notebook because it doesn't feel real. Yep. And when I transcribe my handwritten notes into the word processor, I actually punch it up as I go. Like I'll make changes as I go. And, oh, that's not a good line. I'm going to change it as I go. Should, like, that should always be something that you give yourself freedom to do at every single step of the process. And I would say that that's something that I would, uh, that I would encourage you to do. So like, as you're moving from log line to Adam's completely original seven sentences, if you realize that you have a better idea for the objective. Yeah. Do it now. Change it. Change do it, it while it's seven do sentences. It. Do it. Yeah. Don't do it after you've written your first draft. Like that's what this was all about. Like, Oh my God. I know I've been there. I know so many writers who have had to do page one rewrites because they just didn't think through the story really deeply. And they found out, mid process. Oh, that objective doesn't really work. Oh, this is the wrong character. 
hmm. oh, they or, or this is the right character in the wrong story. Yeah. Like, like there's so, like so many, and some people don't realize that, and they have a terrible draft, and it just doesn't work for some reason, or it doesn't inspire them, or they get burned out on it. Like, yeah, I don't know, man. Hmm. Yeah, love yourself is the is the is the tenth step, right? Hmm. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's add it in. No, no, Why is it no. feel yourself. No, that's what Alexi would say. Feel, feel yourself. Yeah, like that sounds yourself. bad. Uh, <laughs> it does sound bad. But how come feel your all... writing? Love, love yourself. Love thyself. Why does it do that? I don't like why it looks like that. It's maybe a, because it's, it's, it's so much more important. Yeah. Um, but oh, so an idea that I wanted to circle back to that I forgot to mention before when we were talking about what a bad idea is. Here is my theory on bad ideas. Okay. Obviously, there are some that just like, that I suppose you could just say are done before. And in a sense, that's a bad idea. Like if it's completely, like if I'm completely putting Star Wars down again, that's probably not a great idea. But beyond that, I would say that bad ideas are more personal to the writer. <laughs> like it might be a bad idea for me to write a script, not a bad idea in general. And I think yes. a lot like of that you don't comes... have you don't have experience to add mm -hmm. to something, and it's just yeah. like setting yourself up for failure. Exactly, and I think that for me that comes down to choosing a thematic question that is something that you actually care a lot about, and that's something that you are passionate about exploring, because then you have like the cohesion of the entire story. And I mean, there's also things that come in to that come into play like are the literal characters that you're choosing people that you can authentically speak to and things like that. But overall, I think that a bad idea is one that you can't use like your full passion on, whether that's because you don't completely connect with the theme or because you can't connect with the characters. Um, I'd say that's what you're most at risk for. So checking in about like is this something that matters deeply to me um and is this a character that i like and do i still like this story is really important uh, that yeah. does not mean am i frustrated with the story because you will be very frustrated with the story and you'll be convinced yourself it sucks but just if you ever get stuck if you go back to like this is a story about a fish who loses his son who he was overprotective of and he has to go try to find him is that theme like is that thematically are those characters people that you really care about and if that's still the case then it's not a bad idea so i have uh i, I just i've just uh rem was reminded of i i think this is falsely attributed to william faulkner but he has a great quote or this is a great quote regardless of if it's correct that a writer needs two of three of these qualities to actually write something well you need either inspiration, investigation, which means research, or experience. You need two of the three. So you need inspiration and research, <laughs> or experience and imagination. You need like so it's it's like it's like the college thing about uh, yeah. that you <laughs> that you um what that you can have sleep social life or that's right that's right <laughs> or yeah academics <laughs> so imagination this is a, investigation experience so this is what i would say we've talked about this a little bit i don't remember how much i've blasted it straight on coffee class but john says i can't stand movies that on the surface have political one-sidedness my idea of bad ideas i prefer stories that are more about finding the meaning yourself that's something that we've talked about which is why i personally think most religious movies fail because yeah. the thing that makes it interesting a movie interesting philosophically in my opinion is that you have a thematic question and then each character has their own understandable answer and it's the protagonist's journey to find their answer but in order to do that you have to believe that each character has a viable legitimate answer and like if the you're antagonists doing... are like the antagonists in those films always have a very cartoonishly or shallow line of reasoning. It's like, almost like, oh, they're bad because f the poor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 
worship the devil. You know, it's right. like it's like things that are yeah. not very it's they don't give it complete thought and like they don't make it an option that actually makes sense for a real person. And I think that that's I think that that's really important. You can do movies that have like political stuff going on. I would say that like what's the one City of God. Like there's a there's a lot of really, really good movies that definitely like most movies are political. Avi said that, right? That like yeah, and I think definitely... he's he's convinced me that that's like you can't escape the political context of like choosing characters in a who are members of a class in a country in a situation like their identity is tied to politics, whether or not you're trying to make a political statement or nothing. I do think that ham fisted political statements that aren't thought through that don't really investigate or like get at like the tension points of philosophical conflict where it's just philosophical preaching. Yeah. It, it's like, Oh, nobody likes to be preached or, or it, even if you do, it's sort of like, yeah, I agree with that. And that's a very shallow form of engagement. Um, you know, I want, well, I want yeah. the, the investigation. I want to understand. I want the antagonists to be substantial. I want them to be like, Oh, you know, they have a point. Thanos like had a Thanos. point, right? <laughs> I mean, I disagree. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but you really like that. That's, that's the, it's really hard to do that though. <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's really and hard it's to like, do that. But it's honestly, it's annoying even when you agree if it's heavy handed because like, like I look, sue me. I really like Supergirl on the CW. All right. I haven't seen I it. I do. And they sometimes do episodes that are just like completely political in premise and it's stuff that i agree with like it's it's political beliefs that i share but i don't like it being hammered at me anyway i mean i still watch the show because it didn't other bother reasons. me enough to quit it but yeah yeah other reasons <laughs> and um but you know it's i i don't enjoy being preached at even when it's things that i like don't tell me but, what to there's do. A difference, there is a difference, though, between preaching and drama, right? Like, because yeah. my, my definition of drama is that it's about the push and pull of, of beliefs and ideas mm -hmm. in a way that's like there's something underneath it. If it's just uh, you have, like, a character who's like a paper-thin representation of a belief, when you push at it, it falls apart and it feels false, right? Um, yeah. Parasite is a fantastic example of this. That yes. movie is a political yeah. Rorschach test. There are all these uh, right wing commentators who are like, oh, that poor, the poor Park family. They, these these hanger ons <laughs> infiltrated their life. And then there are all these like left wing, you know, people who are like, oh, my God, eat the rich, the, the Kim family. You know, but like the fact that the movie works for both groups of people says something about that it's an you actually get a sense of who all these people are, what they really believe on a human level. And that's like, it. I mean, it's all a good movie, but like it's got, it really does that well. And I do think that uh, uh, the filmmakers had a point of view personally, but I think that they, despite having their point of view, they did not like misrepresent or they did justice to both points of view like you really understood where the parks were at even if the kims were the yeah. protagonists and if that's something that matters to you if you are if you are like a lot of us and are telling stories for like yes you want to write stories you want to entertain people but there's also something that's like you know that matters to you a lot that you want to share with the world then it probably matters to you that you're able to tell stories where people are going to be receptive to what you're saying yeah um and so if that if that is you, and I think it's most of us, then it's important to consider the fact that your message will be much more, much more uh, well received if it's given in a way that's balanced and lets people come to their own conclusion. Um, because even if, remember, even yeah, if it's sorry. clear what, even if it's clear like what the conclusion should be, like I'd say, watching Parasite, you know what the you know what the writers wanted your conclusion to be. But I, I do think I do think they had a point of view, though, like because they left one thing yeah. ambiguous, like it, which was where Kim, where, where the Kim family was at the end, like belief wise, like they left it ambiguous of whether, whether or not 
uh, the son had the actually got the house later on and followed the dream or whether he was just desperate and alone. Spoilers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, so I think it's okay. Um, so... I've heard about The Chosen. That, like, that's a totally crowdfunded show about uh, Jesus. And it's really, really? popular. Yeah, and I've, I've, I read an article about it, the, the business. I'm curious what that I've never is. seen it. Um, I've not seen it. I'm not particularly religious. So. But um, I, I think, I think like, I want, like, regardless of your political beliefs, mm -hmm. you should do justice to all points of view in your story. Like, that's just good writing. Like, and, and I, I truly believe that. Like, and, and <laughs> so much of, like, uh, you know, so much of like the angst around like, oh, I feel like I'm being preached at all the time is that just that it's like it's it's either, you know, virtue signaling that has nothing to do with the genre, genre drama or it's, you know, paper thin straw mans of beliefs that aren't actually what the people believe. Right. I think those that those are the extremes of like that bad feeling. But like at the end of the day it's completely okay to embrace politics. Just do something interesting with the characters. Make us believe that it's part of the world. Make like good, make interesting conflict happen. Make people make choices, you know. The Expanse. Um, oh, that's a perfect, that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. I think The Expanse is a fantastic show. And if you have not seen it, I would highly recommend it. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, and they, it's completely about politics entirely and i mean they've put it in the future um where you know the politics that we're talking about have to deal with earth mars and the asteroid belt but that's essentially just our current earth social classes pushed into different places yeah so it's it's the same it's a really similar thing to what we're dealing with now but it's just a different way for them to explore it and you get perspectives on all sides that you're like okay I can see it. And I think that that's one that handles it really, really well. Um, one thing I do want to add on though, like uh, on the subject is I, I think that a lot of people don't take the idea of protagonist seriously, like mm -hmm. really thinking about what that is. Like protagonist is like the eyes and heart of a story. It's the empathy point of a story and mm -hmm. who your story is about, like has a political like responsibility, like as a human being, right? Like, do you want to show, do you want to write about a pedophile and like glorify their experience and make us sympathize about them? Like, is that the, is that the effect of the story? Like, I think there is social responsibility. You probably shouldn't do that. You know, yeah. like in, with, unless it's extremely like the threshold for earning that story is really high, like conceptually, yeah. like, you know, that's true. Uh, not everything's you are responsible for your story and not everything yeah. is a story that is positive. <laughs> I don't know. Well, well, like, within your social context, like you have to realize that yeah. like every person who's ever going to read your story or watch your story is a human being who lives in this world. And like we unfortunately or fortunately don't live in a world where stories are in a vacuum outside of that. And like, yeah, I do think uh, some people are extremely trigger happy and are just waiting to trash stuff for vague political reasons and assumptions that they project. But I also think that there's a real like, you know, people are allowed to not like things for any reason. And it's okay. Like, I'm not I don't want to be saying that, like, oh, I'm against, you know, political judgment. All. I just I just wish that the stories were just <laughs> just better <laughs> overall, no matter what, you know, I just want there I want there to be like an act the writers to the threshold of writers to like be like actually getting at the good shit. I want that to be higher. But should do it. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a tall ask. Um, unfortunately, at least in the American film industry, there's a lot of bad stuff right now, and also yeah. always have been, always will be. But I mean, Expanse is really interesting. That's happening. That's a great show. I'm watching The Witcher, and I know that some people don't like it. I love. But it. I do. I, <laughs> I loved season two of that. Um, that's that's me and Carl are getting through right now, and I think it's really really great so far. Um, it's so much better than Wheel of Time. It's not even funny. <laughs> I'm like, trying like, to like Wheel of Time. No, really no, I, 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 yeah, I like fantasy nonsense. Um, you know, that's me. I mean, I'm still watching it, but like, I want to like be passionate, and I just I care much more about Witcher right now and Expanse. Well, if you think um, about it. Think about it. The show has three protagonists. 
not seven. Right? Yeah. They like we like it's all about Geralt, Yennefer, Siri. And we yep. have the time and space to really give a damn about all three of them and all the things they want and what they're doing. And uh, Wheel of Time, you know, there's Moraine, Rand, Perrin, Niev, Aguin, Matt. I did, or, you, you know, like, it's like... Frankly, I don't even know their names because there's too many I read the books them, as a child. And I didn't um, read the books, so... I read the yeah, books Yeah, I didn't tell you who these people are. And I, if I was I just watching them. the show, I'd be like, uh, pouty redhead. Um, yep. <laughs> strong, big, big, boring blacksmith. Hey, do you remember um, what's his name when he he did Day of Thrones where he would cut people's hair and then oh yeah yeah them. Jonathan yeah, yeah 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 and he would say uh, he called Daenerys Christina Aguilera and uh, <laughs> <That's terrible. laughs> have all those that. great names for people loved it. Um, well, we're we're at the end of time. Um, we are. What are we doing next week? We have not decided. Oh, it's our last we... one of the year. Uh, what what's after carding? <laughs> Drafting. We can do drafting. Yeah, let's do it. This is a series. Let's go through it. Let's go through it. Okay, so next week we will do first draft. And maybe we'll even touch on hating yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that'll be the next episode. That'll be the week after. Um, we have an entire episode called Hating Yourself. A screenwriter's I, journey. I really liked The Mandalorian. I really liked it I did a too. lot. I thought it was really well written. I thought, I thought it was... It felt, it felt really episodic in a way that most serial stories don't. Like it, it felt. I what I really it was refreshing to feel like, oh, the, he's on a side adventure, and they move the big story just a little bit. Like I yeah. thought that that was kind of refreshing, and I enjoyed it. I mean, it felt Finale. like levels kind of been like a video game. Like you're yeah. like, now I'm in this area, and I'm mm. gonna do this little thing, and then you move on to the next one, and do all that. Yeah, <laughs> but it was fun. I thought the the finale was a uh, cop out, and I hated it. But that's just me. Um, I don't remember it honestly. Luke shows up. Oh, that! Did you see that some kid, like some like random kid, edited him much better than they did? And uh, then I, I saw the corridor cruise. Him? I saw I saw the corridor cruise version. But yet, uh, I know a lot of people were like, "That was CGI. Was kind of wonky, you know." <laughs> it didn't look like him. It looked like Topher Grace. Oh God! <laughs> it looked like Topher Grace. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, man. John T. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, it just didn't work <laughs> for me. It didn't work for me. I did love the finale of the season one, uh, and I and I loved the episode right before. I loved the Bill Burr episode where we got to meet the stormtrooper. Like I thought it was really good. I thought it was really good. Cool. Well, sorry. thank you everybody for spending uh, Christmas Eve with us. If you celebrate. I forgot and, it was Christmas Eve. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, now that tells people a lot about me. <laughs> <laughs> so have a good Christmas if you celebrate. Have a good Boxing Day if you are Canadian. Uh, and everything else until we see you next week. When we talk about first draft and hating yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we might get to hating yourself. <laughs> That's a if big topic. If we have time. If we have time. If we have time. All right. Bye. Bye everybody.